All right. Today, I want to talk about what gun control actually means. It's a nebulous term. A lot of people throw it around when they're trying to make an argument for or against people owning guns. And really, it's very simple. When you own a gun, you're responsible for it. You need to control it. You need to keep it away from people who have no business touching it, like your kids, for example. And you just need to make sure that you're being responsible and keeping it safe. If you keep it in your home, you need to lock it up in a safe, in a briefcase, whatever. It just needs to be locked up and safe. That is gun control. Now, I'm posting this video because there's a lot of confusion about where school shooters get their weapons. And I can tell you that I've been researching individual incidents of school violence for over 19 years. And I've researched incidents that go back as, as far back as the 50s, okay? This is something that has been happening a lot. And it's in the news lately more than it's ever been except maybe a 10-year period in the 1990s, but it's not new. And the one thing over 90% of school shootings have in common, other than the fact that the perpetrators are almost always male, 99.9% .9 of the time, but these kids are getting the guns from their parents, or they're stealing them from friends, they're stealing them from their friends' parents, and they're stealing them from their neighbors. Or their parents bought them the guns, thinking that it was somehow going to help them. And that's why we have a big problem, because the facts are these teenagers are mostly stealing the weapons from their parents. And the guns are owned legally by the parents. So the issue isn't really one-sided. It's not that we don't need to make sure that background checks are done and all that. But in reality, that's not going to stop somebody from obtaining a weapon when they really want one. Um, what these kids do is they look for ways they can get a gun by stealing it from people. Um, parents are careless. They're careless. There was an incident not that long ago where uh, a cop had a loaded weapon in his dresser drawer and his kid took it and used it in a school shooting. Um, a cop. Okay, the problem is parents think they can trust their kids. And I'm telling you right now, if you're a parent watching this, you can't trust your kid. You can't say, oh, well, you know, my kid is responsible. He would never use my weapons in a school shooting. You can say that all you want, actually, but it's not the truth because you don't know. You have no idea. And that's actually the problem. That's why people don't want to hear that you need to lock up your guns because if parents admitted that yes okay I need to lock up my guns that's simultaneously admitting that yes my kid might be a future school shooter and that's really what's at the heart of this debate over whether or not parents should be held responsible when their children steal their weapons and kill people um, it's not that parents don't want to be responsible they really do and they think they're being responsible that's another problem they really believe that they're being responsible and they think responsibility looks like teaching their kids gun safety, teaching their kids how to shoot their own weapons. Um, that's not responsibility. That's a whole other issue. I am not against guns. I am pro second amendment. I am pro gun. Um, I've even owned six guns in the past. I don't anymore, but I did. And I am not anti-gun in any way. However, Teaching your kids how to properly handle a weapon is not being responsible. It's not irresponsible, but what I'm saying is that that is not a method to prevent your kids from having the mindset that they want to kill other people. It, they're just, they're two separate subjects. They're not even related. So when it comes to kids obtaining weapons to attack their schools, I think it's pretty simple. Um, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, they're stealing weapons from their parents. 
And if they find out their friends have a gun in the house, they devise ways to steal the gun from their friend's parents. It happens all the time. So really, we're dealing with two issues here. We're dealing with, obviously, the mindset. That's the original source of the cause of school violence. Obviously, people choose to be violent, and that's, that's, that's the cause right there, right? So we can deal with that on one level. On another, on another level, parents have a responsibility as a gun owner to make sure that their guns are locked up. It, it's just common sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense not to because when you have a baby, one of the first things you do is you baby-proof your house. You stick those little plastic things in the electrical sockets so the baby doesn't electrocute themselves. Um, you take all the sharp knives away so your toddlers can't reach into the kitchen drawer and grab a steak knife and hurt themselves. You know, when you're a parent, you understand that there are inherent risks of just even living in a house with normal things because your children could get hurt. You don't give them sharp plastic objects. You don't let them suck on plastic bags. You make sure that their toys are safe. I mean, this is just common sense. So why is it that we can all agree on that. Like, yes, parents need to be responsible when they have children in the house and make sure that their kids aren't tripping over wires, they're not going to electrocute themselves, and they're not playing with knives, okay? That makes sense. But somehow, that same logic is completely ignored when it comes to guns. And I'll tell you why. Again, it's a symptom of the not-my-kid syndrome. Because every parent in America thinks that their kid is not going to be the next school shooter, and most of them are wrong because they have no idea. They cannot say for sure their, their kid is or is not going to use their weapons to kill other people. Because after every school shooting, every incident of violence, every suicide, every, every incident of violence that involves a gun, the first thing the parents say is... I can't believe it was my kid. I never saw the signs. I didn't see it coming. The community says the same thing. Sometimes the friends say, well, yeah, I kind of had an idea that this was, you know, possible, but I didn't really think he was going to go through with it. Teachers say the same thing. Like, well, you know, there were some signs, but I, you know, I wasn't really, you know, I was concerned, but I wasn't really concerned that much because he didn't really talk about violence or whatever. That's always the case. Nobody ever sees it coming, Okay. And it's because they're in denial. It's the not my kid syndrome. This can't happen to my kid. This can't happen in my town. This can't happen in my school. This can't happen to our community. People think they live in a bubble. And I'm sorry, but if you think you live in a bubble, you need a reality check because you do not live in a bubble, okay? This issue is coming to a head, okay? And people are really starting to get angry. And they're angry because they don't have solutions. They have no clue. Most people don't have the luxury of being able to understand what it's like to want to go through with a school shooting, okay? And I do because I was actually arrested and pushed through the juvenile justice system for planning an attack against my school when I was uh, 14. It was long before Columbine. And my plans never came to fruition because, number one, I couldn't get my hands on a weapon, okay? That was number one. If I had been given access to a weapon when I was 14, I would be dead right now, and other people would be too. And none of my friends had weapons, or at least if they did, I didn't know about it. I didn't go over to anybody's house where they said, hey, guess what, my dad's got a shotgun in the closet, or, you know, whatever. That just never happened. And had that happened, I probably would have devised a way to figure out how to steal it, because that was letting me know that, hey, Here's your opportunity to get a weapon. So I could never get a weapon. And over time, the desire just faded on its own naturally. It took a while, but it did. So, you know, there's a lot to be said for gun owners being responsible about keeping their guns locked up so that their kids and their kids' friends can't access them. Because I guarantee you, parents, if you have a gun in the house and your child knows about it, they tell their friends. They will definitely tell their friends. And that is not a good situation to have. Okay, how many times have we heard about situations where somebody goes over to somebody else's house and they have a gun and they start playing around with it. One kid says, hey, I want to show you my gun. 
or I want to show you my father's gun or my mom's whatever um, pistol or my mom's shotgun. Um, here it is. And then the kids start messing around with it and then somebody gets shot. They, kids shoot their little siblings all the time on accident because they're messing around with guns and parents are keeping them loaded literally just leaning against the wall in the closet or in a dresser drawer and that is not okay um, and that applies not just to little kids but teenagers as well and even after because I'll tell you what there was a time I think I was 20 I was either 20 or 21 and I had just inherited six guns from my father when he passed away and two of those were Ruger Red Hawks one was a 44 one was a 357 and they were in a locked case in my closet. And I had actually told two of my friends that I had them. And at the time, my ignorance actually contributed to their ignorance because I never should have even mentioned it. I never should have even said anything. But I did. And I shared my life with these people. And there were two guys. And one of them came over to my house one day. And he wanted to see them. And so I'm thinking, sure, why not? Because I'm thinking he's responsible. I think he, I, I'm not thinking that he's going to do anything stupid, right? So I open the case and immediately he grabs the 357. He aims it at the wall. He cocks it and he's about to pull the trigger. And the gun was not loaded, but he did not know that. He had no clue. So he was literally about to shoot a hole in the wall. If it had been loaded, it would have shot a hole in the wall. Now, I was living with another woman and her three-year-old son at the time, so, and she didn't even know that I had any weapons in the house. That was actually, I was not supposed to have any weapons in the house, but I just, you know, inherited them, and so I was in the process of trying to figure out, do I want to keep them? Do I want to sell them? So they were just there, and somebody could have gotten hurt if that gun was loaded. Now, it wasn't, so it didn't end up that way, but it could have, and it does all the time with people who are not responsible and they keep their weapons loaded and they let their friends handle them without even knowing whether or not their friends know what the hell they're doing. And then when kids find them on their own, it's the same thing. So I was irresponsible by even telling my friend that I had any type of weapons. And the fact that I let him pick it up was even stupider. So I can tell you from experience on all sides of this issue that we are just being absolutely irresponsible with our guns. This is not about the Second Amendment, people. The Second Amendment, I'm not even going to get into it, but it's not even what you think it is. And this fight that people are pursuing against guns and against all these things with these marches and, and the school walkouts, and it's just a symptom of a much bigger problem, and the bigger problem is that we are in denial, okay? Not even going back to what causes people to feel like they want to kill each other. A bigger problem is that we're in denial about the fact that it's happening, and it's happening everywhere. Nobody is immune. No community is immune. No school is immune. You know, if you're a parent watching this right now, your kid could go to school tomorrow and die just because some parent somewhere decided that they would rather trust their kid than admit that they need to lock up their guns because they don't know if their kid is on the edge or not. Now, parents don't want to be responsible for their child's actions after the fact. You know, they always say, oh, well, I never saw it coming, it's not my fault. And it's not their fault. It's totally not their fault. And responsibility has nothing to do with fault or blame. Responsibility doesn't mean, you know, I should have locked up my guns because my, my kid went on a rampage and now I'm responsible for their rampage because I didn't lock up my guns. No, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that responsible people who own guns lock them up because they don't know. They don't know. You could have somebody come over to your house who's not a teenager and steal your gun. You know, it, the facts are the facts. 90%, actually more than 90%, of school shooters steal their guns from their parents, their neighbors, their friends, and their friends' parents because their parents do not lock the guns up. They leave them in plain sight and everybody knows they exist. Or the parents buy the guns for the kids, teach them how to shoot, teach them how to handle the weapon, and then lock them up in a gun safe and then they actually give their kids a key to the gun safe with the stipulation that they're not allowed to open it without the parents' permission. That's just stupid. 
okay? This issue has gotten way out of hand, and honestly, I am really, really, really tired of hearing the arguments that are not based in facts. And that's part of the reason why I've been writing my book. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to get it done by the end of this year, but I've been writing it for over 15 years. And um, it's got a lot of information inside of it about school shootings and school shooters. And I'm sharing my story about what led me to make that decision that that's what I wanted to do. And I'm also discussing the conversations I had with people who are actually former school shooters. Yes, I've had a lot of conversations with people in the past who have either shot up their school, planned to shoot up their school, or they got caught before they did anything, or people who are just fantasizing about it. I mean, I'm talking thousands of people. This is not just an isolated thing that happens with people who have a bad childhood. Um, no, it's not always about that. It, it's, it's a much deeper issue. And I connected with these people through my website. I ran a research website on the Columbine investigation. It was huge. I had over a million hits at its peak, and um, I have since let it go. But I am rebuilding it. But the thing is, all of the people who crossed paths with me um, understood what it was like well, not everybody, the majority of people, I want to say maybe 90, 95%, they understood what it was like, and that's why they found my website. That's why they were interested. They understood some aspect, not necessarily that, it wasn't necessarily that they wanted to go kill people, but they understood some aspect of Columbine, whether it was the factors that supposedly led to it. I'm not going to mention any of those because that's another topic, and it's debatable. But they, there was something about it that spoke to them and spoke to their experience that they really connected with. And so they found my website, they found me, we started talking. And a lot of the, a lot of the times I had to get law enforcement to intervene because they expressed their actual plans to kill other people. Not just the idea, but their actual plans. Um, and... I have a lot of experience talking to these kids from the point of view of somebody who is listening to them and not from the perspective of the adults in their life who are always telling them what to do and telling them that, that they're wrong and they shouldn't feel the way they feel. I actually had in-depth, very deep conversations with these people. and. I have a lot of information to share and that's where a lot of my information comes from direct experience not just statistics which by the way are incorrect there when I say I I studied incidents of school violence for 19 years I mean I literally went on Google and found news reports for every incident of school violence that I could possibly find and I came up with numbers that were much higher than the Department of Education, what they report on their website. See, when I was doing my research originally, it was long before Google changed their algorithm to prioritize personalization, local search results, and um, what is called latent semantic indexing, which, it, which was a replacement for exact phrase matching. Remember, you used to be able to type something in quotation marks, like uh, lyrics to a song and you would pull up the lyrics to that song. Well, you can't do that anymore. That was exact phrase matching. They phased that out. Now it's latent semantic indexing, which means Google gives you uh, search results that they determine are relevant to whatever you're searching for. So good luck finding something exact. So I have not been able to find um, incidents reported in the news as easily as I was back then. But back then, I could do it like that. And I did. And just to give you an example, in 2005, um, and I am not saying these numbers are completely accurate because uh, it's been 10 or 15 years since I've looked at my data. And I'm obviously in the car right now, so I don't have access to my data, but giving you this as an example. So for example, in 2005, okay, I looked at the Department of Education's website and I found out what criteria they used to determine 
that an incident is an incident of school violence. And I used that criteria to collect my incidents of school violence because I knew that they, they, were, they were estimating too low. So um, when they reported something like 23 incidents of school violence, I had 356 incidents of school violence. That is a huge dispar disparity. And I don't understand, or I didn't understand why those numbers were so different until I looked on the Department of Education's website and found out the way they calculate their incidence of school violence is they take a small sample out of maybe five states in the whole U.S. and they determine how many incidents those states have had and then they average it out for the entire U.S. So they, they use places like Arkansas, um, Utah, uh, and a couple other states that don't have a lot of incidents of school violence. They don't use California, and they don't use Texas, because those have the highest incidence. And even, even in Texas and California, there have been multiple shootings at the same high school. They say lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. Oh, yes, it does. It absolutely does. Um, there have even been survivors from Columbine that went to Virginia Tech and survived the Virginia Tech massacre. Okay, there was a principal. Um, I believe it was the principal at Thurston High School, Kip Kinkle. I could be wrong about that, but there, there was a principal who survived one school shooting and he went to another school and transferred and a few years later he was involved in another school shooting and almost got killed. So this is a problem, but the incidents that the Department of Education report are not accurate. They're lower, and they do that because they don't want you to know that there is a problem as big as there is. And the fact that people don't know the problem is as big as it really is, is part of why the myth perpetuates that it can't happen here. Not my child, not my community, not my school. Okay, that is directly tied to the fact that the Department of Education is reporting inaccurate and low numbers on purpose. You know, they have access to all of the actual statistics of the literal incidents, like a literal list of incidents, but no, they choose to average it out, and that's why, because it, it keeps the perception low. And then, you know, you've got all these students that are protesting assault rifles and doing walkouts, and the problem with that is that they don't even know what they're protesting. Okay, if you're gonna protest something, you should know what it is you're protesting, and you should know why. And if you look at a lot of interviews from the people that are protesting assault rifles, you'll find some very interesting things. First of all, they think AR stands for assault rifle. It doesn't. They don't catch it when they're asked by the interviewer, do you believe in banning fully semi-automatic rifles. They don't catch that that doesn't make any sense. You can't have a fully semi-automatic rifle, but they don't know anything about guns, so they say, oh yeah, yeah, it should be banned. And then when somebody asks them, well, can you define an assault rifle? They say things like, oh yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a gun that can kill a lot of people really quickly. And you know, it's like, it could be a, a handgun or a pistol that somebody uses to, you know, just like kill a bunch of people. I mean, these are literal, literal answers. They have no idea. They have no idea. And it's just amazing that so many people are protesting against something that they don't even understand. And I'm not even mad about it. I'm not upset. I mean, I probably sound like I'm really err uh, about it, but... The truth is, I understand why they're upset. There's a problem, and they don't know how to fix it. People get upset when they don't know how to solve a problem as big as this, something that impacts everybody's lives. Um, I mean, just to give you an example of how widespread this is, um, I just spoke with somebody not that long ago who has been researching and studying the Columbine investigation for a very long time, okay? And they understand why Eric and Dylan wanted to kill people for their own reasons, whatever. I, you know, they understand. A lot of people do. And then one day, they got the news that their best friend died in a shooting by somebody 
who worshipped Eric and Dylan, okay? Now shit's getting real for people. People are realizing the reality of what's happening, and nobody is immune. Nobody. Nobody. And that's why they're mad, and nobody knows how to fix the problem. Because they don't want to face the facts that anybody is capable of anything at any time without any visible reason, warning, nothing. And it's just denial, okay? We're living, we're living in a world of denial. People don't want to face reality. I get it. I get it. But if we're going to stop school violence, we've got to start facing reality. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. But the first step to understanding it, first step to understanding and preventing it, is getting related with reality. And that's what my book and my videos are designed to do. And eventually my website when I get that back up. Because it's time. People need to know what's actually happening so that they actually have the correct information. Because if you rely on the media for your sources, it doesn't matter if it's mainstream media or if it's Alex Jones. You know, Alex Jones, his channel is a joke. It, he's reported so many inaccuracies that it, it's mind-blowing. People believe whatever they want to believe. Okay, I'm not saying his, his channel is completely worthless. That's not what I'm saying at all. But um, what I am saying is that if you get your information about school violence from people who don't know school violence from the inside, your information is probably incorrect. And it's, it's just time for the correct information to come out. So if uh, this video didn't piss you off, stay tuned for more. And I'll see you soon.